Hello again. In the last video, we started talking about functions. It was a very high level overview, kind of mentioning here's some code that's redundant. Maybe we could make this code cleaner if we could write code that does something, put a label on it, and then use that label whenever we want to run that code. The example we were using was GPA Computation Fun. While we're going to return to GPA Computation Fun over the next couple of videos, I first want to introduce functions in terms of coding them up with some small, 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 simple examples. So let's first discuss where we've seen functions before. You've seen functions before quite a bit in this class. Last video I mentioned that you've been writing int main this entire semester. Well, that's the definition for a function. You've also been calling functions. You've been calling a function like rand, srand, time, open, or excuse me, is open, open, good, fail. These are all examples of functions. Anytime you use a mathematical function from the CMath library, like pow or abs or sine or cosine or tangent, those are all functions as well. So there's a lot of jargon to learn related to functions. In fact, I just said two different terms that you may or may not know the difference between. I said define a function and call a function. So we're gonna go through how to define functions and how to call functions in this video. Uh, like I said, we'll work some very simple examples, but we're gonna spend a lot of time on functions because they can get kind of complicated and they're really important. So we wanna make sure that you fully understand the use of functions and why we use them. So let's head over to the notes for today. We've got a lot of learning objectives. I've alluded to calling and defining functions. We're gonna learn how to send input into functions and how to get input, excuse me, how to get output from functions by returning a result. We've got some jargon to learn related to arguments and parameters. And then at the end, I want to introduce the idea of a predicate function just as another simple way to work with functions and start solving them. All right, we will return to GPA computation fun soon in a later video, but for now, let's go ahead and work in functionfun.cpp just so we can introduce functions uh, that are very small little examples. In our last video, I provided a definition for a function. I said a function is a named sequence of statements that solves a problem. Uh, here's a slightly different function definition that says a function is a named sequence of statements that performs a computation. Performs a computation, solves a problem, we can kind of use them interchangeably because we really want to think about computing something that solves a problem. So a general rule of thumb that I like to think about is we can write our own functions and each function we write should solve one task and that solution should be one algorithm. So keep this in mind as we start learning about functions that a function should not do a lot of work. Our main function right now for all of our programs does a lot of work. It solves a bunch of different problems. We should really break that up such that we have one function for each task we need to solve and that implementation requires one algorithm. We learned a little bit about top-down design in our last video and top-down design can really help you figure out what are the functions we need based on what are the tasks we need to solve. Draw a structure chart and those functions should become more clear. Okay, time to start learning about functions. You've seen functions 
outside of this class. For example, you've seen functions in algebra, and I want to lean a little bit on that prior knowledge just to kind of frame functions. Like I said, we've seen int main for defining a function. We've seen calls to pow, rand, srand, time, good, etc. And we can rely on that for our programming knowledge. But to provide more intuition, let's review what you know about functions in algebra. Let's say I wrote y equals f of x, which equals x squared minus 4x plus 4. X and Y are variables. X is an independent variable. Y is a dependent variable. The name of this function is F. And F accepts one input, X. Everywhere X is used in this expression here, we would replace with the value passed in such as f of 2 would be 2 squared minus 4 times 2 plus 4. And we would evaluate this. So we would have 4 minus 8 plus 4. 4 minus 8 is negative 4 plus 4 is 0. So we would say y equals f of 2 which equals zero. So you can think about y as being the result. The result of f of x is y. And we can pass in a specific value for x in order to get a specific value for y. I also like to draw a picture when thinking about functions, even in algebra. Let's say f is this box. Think about it like a process. And f can accept inputs. For example, f accepts one input x. And it can produce outputs. For example, f produces one output y. But we could also define a function that has more than one input. For example, we might have z equals g of x comma y, and maybe this is something like x squared plus y squared. Then a picture for g would show two inputs coming in and only one output coming out. So now that you have a little bit of context for functions beyond programming, like functions in algebra, we can really start to implement a function like f in C++. f accepts an input. It has some kind of mathematical relationship to produce an output. So let's go ahead and code up this function f as a C++ function. First, we have to define a function. To define a function, we have to specify the name of the function, any inputs to the function, any outputs of the function, and lastly, the code that operates on the inputs to produce the outputs. So we're going to write a function C++ that represents this function in algebra. So let's start with the name. The name of the function is f. In C++, we can use any valid identifier. Same rules apply for functions as apply for variable names. 
Then we have a parenthesis, and here we have a formal parameter list. This is where we specify variables to store the incoming values, the inputs. So we'll have one. It's a variable called x of type integer. So let me just make a note here. A parameter is a variable that stores an input argument. And we'll come back to argument here shortly. To provide context for argument now, in our example where we computed f of 2, 2 was an argument. All right. Then we have curly braces that are used to group code as part of the body of this function. This should look very familiar. We've seen curly braces that group our code to the body of our main function. We've seen curly braces for our if, else if, and else. We've seen curly braces for our switch, and we've seen curly braces for all of our Luby constructs used to group code together. Any code here belongs to the body of this function. Now, outputs. Let's get this over a little bit. We can specify that this function returns a value, it has an output, by putting the data type of that return value right before the function. So let's assume that this function accepts an integer and produces an integer. So we would put int here. This represents the data type of the return value. So how do we return a value? For now, I'm going to add code to this body such that this function only returns a single value. Let's say it always returns 5. So this 5 here is an integer. So this data type specified before the name of the function is int. These have to match. Whatever you put after the return has to be of the same data type as specified before f. Okay, so this function doesn't actually compute this relationship here, so let's change that now. I'll have a variable called y, and y is assigned x raised to the power of 2 minus 4 times x plus 4. And I want to return the value in y. All right, we are done. This is the definition for our function f in C++. We've got the name of the function, variables to store inputs coming into this function. We've got the return type, data type, do the return values data types specified before the name of the function. We've got our computational relationship for our formula for f. We return the result that's stored in y. y is declared as an integer, and that matches the return type we specified for this function. Now, this code does not execute until the function is called. So I'm going to put that up here. 
next to this, aka execute or invoke. In order to call a function, we have to specify the name of the function that we want to execute. We have to specify inputs to the function. And if the function returns a value, we have to do something with the output. So let me be more specific. Let's say we're going to call this function f. We're in main. We're going to need a integer variable to store the value returned from this function call. In order to call f, we specify the name, open paren, and then we put values that are going to be input to our function in the parentheses, semicolon. If this function returns a value, there'll be a data type here. We'll need to have a variable of the same data type in the code that's calling this function to store that return value. Now, if a function doesn't return any values, this here will be void. If a function doesn't return a value, then there'll be no return statement. All right, so let's say I add a see out statement here and we see out result. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that we would come back to the idea of an argument. Two here, is called an actual argument. It's a value. It's a value that's passed in as an input. This value is then copied into a variable inside of the function that stores that incoming value. So when this code executes in main, an integer variable called result is allocated Function calls have higher precedence than assignment operators, so the function f is called or executed or invoked, passing in the argument of 2. 2 is copied into this variable x, and now the program executes f from top to bottom based on the code and the definition of f. A variable y is allocated and initialized to 0. Function call. So this is a function call as well, has higher precedence than assignment. So pow is executed, passing in x and 2. The result of that is then used in the rest of this arithmetic expression, uh, 4 times x, so x is 2 in this example, uh, is added to 4 and subtracted from this pow result here. That result is stored in y, which we know to be 0 when 2 is passed in and stored in x, and then we return y. So what happens here y is returned and used in place of f of 2, which means y's value, 0, is copied into result. Now this looks like a lot. If you're feeling a little overwhelmed, don't worry. This is a challenging concept. That's why we work through a lot of examples. There are a few more things related to functions, but we'll keep it simple for now. 
You'll definitely want to ingrain in your brain the difference between a function definition and a function call. A function definition actually defines the code to be executed when a function is called. A function call is what actually says, hey program, go execute this code now. You can always tell the difference between a function call and a definition because a function call won't have curly braces, a function definition will. We can further break down parts of the definition by introducing a little bit more terminology. All of this information on the first line here is called the function header. The header contains the data type of the return value, the name of the function, and the parameter list. Everything after the header is called the function body. And together, the function body and the function header form the function definition. So lots of jargon here to learn, but it is important that you do learn it because these terms call, define, parameter, argument, header, body, these are ubiquitous. You will see them everywhere and you need to know what they mean. Okay, so let's head over to our functionfun.cpp file and code this up. So in our code, we need to put our function definitions before any code that calls the function. This is because the compiler needs to know about the function before it can execute it when it encounters a function call. So that means we're going to put all of our function definitions above the function in which they're called. If we're going to call our function f from main, then we should put f above main. All right, so we run our code and we see that f of 2 does in fact return 0, which matches our desk check. So that's awesome. We can pass in some different values, so let's try passing in 4 and see what that gives us. Gives us 4. We could check that by hand if we would like. 4 squared is 16. Minus 4 times 4 is 16, is 0, plus 4 is 4. Okay, let's try 3 and see what that gives us. Gives us 1. 3 squared is 9, minus 4 times 3 is 12, is negative 3. Negative 3 plus 4 is positive 1. So that makes sense. Awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste this code just so we can see that we can call a function f multiple times. That's one of the beauties of writing functions. Every time we want to find out what f evaluates to from, for some certain value of x, we don't have to copy and paste this code putting in a different value here. We can just call this function another time and pass in a different value, which makes our code really reusable. Now you can see that we have different outputs based on different calls of f. Each time we call f here, we're passing in a different value 
that's copied into X. All right, let's head back over to the lesson notes just to kind of fill in some gaps related to our knowledge of functions. So here's a general template for defining a function. Typically you'll have a comment block at the top of the function that describes what the function does. For more details on this, take a look at the style guide for the class. For the code we write in class, we're probably not gonna have enough time to write function blocks or documentation blocks like this, but for code you turn in for programming assignments, every function should have a comment block before it. Then we get to our function header. This whole line here is our function header. It starts with the data type of the return value, and then it has the name of the function, open paren, close paren, and then a list of all of the parameters that store incoming values. Then we have our curly braces that denote the body of our function. Inside of the curly braces, we have one or more executable statements. If this function returns a value, then there'll be a return statement and the value to return. Note that whatever value you return here, its data type should match the data type specified as the return data type. All right, a few more things to note about functions. When you name your functions, I highly advise that you name them such that they start with a verb instead of a noun. Functions are like actions. They do things, they compute things, they solve things. So they should be named such that they do something. In our little example here, we named our function f in order to kind of fall back on our algebraic knowledge of functions, but that's not a very good function name. We should name this something like compute f, something like that. Start with a verb. That way it's really easy to see in your code when you're working with a variable or a function. Variables typically have names that start with nouns. Functions typically have names that start with verbs. When you name your functions, you should use camel case, and you should not use any names that are standard as part of C++. Like you wouldn't wanna name a function pow because then you wouldn't be able to use the pow inside of the math library. We've talked about the function header, the return type function name, and the parameter list. We talked about the function body, and we've talked about return. You can have multiple return statements in a function. I think that in this class it's best to only have one because it makes code more readable. Just like in loops, how sometimes it's not really clear to use a break statement, but sometimes it is. Kind of the same thing for using return statements in a function. Usually only having one is the most clear, but it kind of depends on the programmer preference. Okay, let's take a look at an example of calling a function. Suppose we have a function called display GPA as part of our GPA computation fun that we will finish writing in our next video. If we want to call a function called display GPA and it accepts a single argument, a double value, then we could just pass in that double value. This function doesn't return any results, so there's no assignment operator on the left side, and there's no variable to store that return value. Looking at the function definition, we can tell that this function doesn't return a value because it says void for the return type. We see in our function header that after the name of the function, we have a parameter list where we list variables that will store these incoming values. So in this function call, 3.4 is copied into the local variable GPA so that whenever we want to refer to the 3.4 on this call to display GPA, we use the GPA variable. 
I want to note that if you have more than one parameter in a function definition, when you call the function, you need to specify more than one argument. The number of arguments depends on the number of parameters, and the order does matter. For example, if you have a double and then an integer, when you call the function, you should specify your double value and then your integer value. So the order does matter. And this is under correspondence rules. The number of actual arguments must match the number of formal parameters, and the order of arguments determines correspondence. All right. We have learned a lot in this video. If you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed, like I said, it's okay. We're going to work a lot of examples, including another, another example right now. All right, the example we're going to work right now is implementing a predicate function. A predicate function doesn't mean anything special in C++. It's just kind of a label we give to functions that return a Boolean. And recall that a Boolean is true or false. So we're going to write a function that's a predicate function. It returns true or false. Let's write this as a task. Define and call a function that determines if an integer is even or not. All right, so we know how to test if a number is even or not, right? We can use our little mod operator trick. Now we just need to write a function that does this. So let's start with our definition first. This is a predicate function. It's going to return true or false. So our return type is bool. Remember that I said we should name our functions such that they start with a verb. So let's call this something like check is even or check if even. This function does need to have one input. So this is going to be the number to test. And it's going to return true or false if this number is even or not. So we need a parameter here to store our incoming number to check. And then our curly braces for our body. Recall that this first line with the return type, the name, and the parameter list form our function header. So what we can do here is have a bool variable, perhaps call it is even, and we can check if num mod two is equivalent to zero then this number is actually even, so we should change this to true. Is even is our result, and we want to return it so that main or whatever function is going to call check if even can use it. Note that is even is declared as a bool. That's why the return type is bool, because we're returning a bool. Awesome, this looks great. Now we want to call the function. Step two. 
what I'm going to do here is actually not even declare a variable to store the return type. I'll show you that I can just use the return value directly in a Cout statement. So I'm going to pass in an odd number, and when we code this up, we'll make sure that this returns zero for false. This is not an even number. And then we should test it for an even number. Like 10. So these are both function calls. Two function calls here. This function returns a value, which we can check by looking at the return type of the header. So therefore, once this code finishes executing as part of this call, it's going to return a value that we can just see out. All right. So let's go ahead and run this in our function fun.cpp file. I'm going to code this up slightly different here, just for fun. If num mod 2 equals 0, then I can immediately return true. So this is an example of having multiple return statements. As soon as a return statement is hit, this function is exited. For example, if I were to put something down here, this would actually be unreachable code because we know that one or the other of these bodies will always execute. And since each body has an unconditional return statement, then this line of code is never going to be reached. And there's our false for 3 being even and our true for 10 being even. All right, this was a long video. We covered a lot. The key with functions is to practice, 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 and that's what we're going to do. We saw two examples today with our algebraic function f and with our predicate function check if even. In our next video, we're going to return to our GPA computation fund and resolve that whole problem to make use of top-down design, modular programming, and functional decomposition.